Hey everyone, what you're about to listen to is an interview that I did with Alexandra Elbakian, who is the founder of SciHub. Alexandra has to be probably one of my dream guests, and I feel very, very lucky and fortunate to have been able to get her onto the podcast, but it did come with some slight difficulties, mainly being that Alexandra doesn't speak in English, um, even though she can understand it. So for this interview, what you'll notice is that I will ask questions in English, and then Alexandra will respond in Russian. And since most of you guys who are listening probably don't understand Russian, neither do I, I was lucky enough to find Maria, who is a translator between Russian and English, to help me out with the translations. So after I ask a question in English, Alexandra will begin to answer that question in Russian, but then what I do for the editing is that I basically just give the first few seconds of Alexandra speaking in Russian, and then I fade it out for the actual translation that Maria gave during the interview. So I just wanted to give a heads up for that. Um, and I also wanted to mention why I wanted so much to have Alexandra on the podcast to talk about SciHub is because I think SciHub is one of the best examples uh, for the left to look at when thinking about cryptocurrencies as a tool for organizing. I think when you listen to the interview, it'll become very clear as to why Alexandra chose to only provide cryptocurrencies as an option to pay uh, her to uphold the infrastructure for SciHub to make science freely available to everyone. And so I highly encourage people, if they have the ability to do so, if they have some cryptocurrency to spare, to go to scihub.ru slash crypto donate and throw some cryptocurrency her way. Additionally, if you're feeling extra giving, you can also go to my Patreon at patreon.com slash the blockchain socialist and pitch into my efforts starting at $3 a month if you think that the content that I make is important. So you can help me out and join the newest patrons like Marvin Lin, Rat Queen, and Miles Payton. Any amount really helps since making this stuff isn't free in terms of money or time. As a patron, you'll get a shout out on an episode like I just did and access to Patreon exclusive content like Q&A episodes where you can submit and vote on questions you'd like me to answer and I'll give my thoughts in roughly 20 minutes. In the latest Patreon episode, I actually just gave a review of my experience at Lisbon Blockchain Week, which also includes some references to another project that actually I've started recently, um, but that I haven't announced to the public yet. Of course, I'll still be making free content like this interview to help spread the message that blockchain does not need to be used to further entrench capitalist exploitation if we put our efforts into it. And so if that message resonates with you, I hope you'll consider out. But also make sure you help out Alexandra with SciHub if you have some cryptocurrency to spare. But yeah, that's it for me. Let's get to the interview with Alexandra. All right. Hello, everyone. You're listening to the Blockchain Socialist Podcast, and I have probably a guest today that I have been the most excited to have on my podcast, actually. Um, I have Alexandra Elbakian. She is the founder of SciHub, and SciHub is basically, if you don't know, it's one of the first pirating websites in the world that's been able to provide mass and public access to tens of millions of academic research papers to people for free. I've personally used this website like crazy. Uh, it's really helped me a lot for being able to read academic papers, um, and uh, it's, it has a mission that I really, really agree with, um, and one of the very interesting things about SciHub is that uh, they accept cryptocurrency in order to fund its operations. Um, and so I thought Alexandra would be a really great guest to have um, to talk about her experience of uh, making SciHub and about um, handling cryptocurrency and, and things like that. So hi, Alexandra, how are you doing? Привет. Да, в принципе, неплохо. Hi, not bad. Great. Um, so maybe to start off, I think it would be really interesting just to hear from you. Um, what exactly inspired you to start SciHub? Mm. Ну, здесь не было как-то определенного одного источника вдохновения. 
so there wasn't a specific uh, single thing that inspired me to start the project. Well, first of all, I was a student myself and I was uh, writing on and working on the topic of neural computer interfaces. And then I faced the problem that most of the scientific articles that I needed for my work were with paid access and I thought I would need to come up with some sort of a uh, program to uh, deal with it uh, and uh, the logic was as follows so if we can access and download free movies or free music online then why isn't there a thing for scientific papers and second I then noticed that a lot of people were faced with the same problem and would need the solution for it. Nice so it, it seems to come from a very um a very practical reason for why you needed something like that. It was, uh, you, you had a problem and you needed to fix it. <laughs> yes, that's about it. It's not like there was some you know, global idea and ideology behind it. So now that Sci-Hub has been around for a while, um, of course, uh, it's been all over the news that Sci-Hub has had some uh, legal issues. But I'm wondering if you could talk about just all the different types of issues that you've faced since starting Sci-Hub. Um, since, you know, Sci-Hub is directly um, eating into the profits of large journals, large scientific and academic journals like Elsevier and like all these other ones who basically um, gate access to publicly funded scientific research. So I'm wondering what types of things have you faced in starting uh, Sci-Hub? No, so yeah, well, uh, speaking about legal problems, so uh, the main problem is that Sci-Hub gets sued in various countries, France, Italy, Switzerland, the UK, and in Russia. And uh, in most of those countries, the access is actually just banned by the provider. But uh, specifically in the US, since 2000. 15, uh, they, uh, they decided that I would need to pay them $15 million. Well, I haven't paid that yet. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a crazy amount of money. I mean, I've also heard as well um, some reports about things like, I mean, like the FBI subpoenaing you and, you know, some form of uh, surveillance from these type of state uh, security apparatuses from the U.S., um, and then, of course, like um, issues with uh, having any sort of like bank account or um, and yeah, of course, like you've mentioned, all these site uh, takedowns. Mm. OK, uh, speaking of FBI, well, first of all, when I work, I always keep in mind that all the information which is based on why which is stored in widely accessible servers can potentially be read by the FBI. That's why I just don't store confidential data and confidential information on platforms such as Google or Apple, etc. cetera. Uh, speaking of the thing that you mentioned that was on the news, uh, so um, I did find in my mailbox once an email from Apple which stated that two years ago, the FBI had requested uh, information uh, uh, on me and that Apple had provided that information. But like, I do have an Apple account, but I don't use it mostly. And of course, I don't uh, store anything confidential there. So this particular investigation didn't cause me any inconvenience. However, I found it quite hilarious. So I did post it on Twitter and the tweet became really popular gained about a million views and even Edward Snowden reacted and he uh, called uh, Sci-Hub one of the greatest scientific achievements. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I saw that um, that tweet as well. It's, I mean, it's kind of interesting in that, I mean, Apple sort of uh, markets itself as the like more privacy respecting tech company compared to the other ones. But in reality, is what kind of what you're showing is that Apple is just sort of like any other tech company. Really, if they're pushed hard enough, they will give information to uh, you know the FBI or whoever asks them because they want to continue to exist, to continue making profits, et cetera, et cetera. 
Ну, если честно, конечно, я не знаю, может быть, это паранойя, но мне кажется... Well, to be honest, I don't know if it's, if it's going to sound paranoid, but I do think that Apple computers themselves may not be very safe, and theoretically they could uh, watch what you're doing at, on your desktop. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, when you first started SciHub, did you ever th even imagine that you would get this level of attention from governments? No. Если говорить, да, об уровне внимания, то я бы не сказала, что в Сайхабу такой уж большой уровень внимания. Well, speaking of the level of attention, I actually wouldn't say that we are very popular with the media. Uh, so people such as Julian Assange or Edward Snowden, they, of course, they were in a much worse situation, but still it looked to me as if they were, you know, promoted in a way. Uh, on the media, there were plenty of news about them. A lot of things were publicized. And Sahab got uh, a couple of uh, uh, articles, a couple of publications at best. So, you know, I don't think we are uh, comparable in, 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 in the level of popularity. Uh, but speaking about you know, legal persecution, of course, when I was setting up the project, I, I, I did understand that it's a pirate project and that people would, uh, would uh, try to close it up here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's I, I imagine that part of the reason is just because, I, at least in the case of Snowden and Assange, it was directly, um, they were directly stealing the secrets of, you know, the state apparatus. Whereas I think in the case of Sci-Hub, um, it's, you know, in, in my opinion, it's giving back what should be free already. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, I guess... It's, it's not as like, you know, sexy for the media to say like, you know, scientific papers are, are free at this website or something like that. Could be part of it. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, I guess it, to me, it seems like just a very, very strange system that we have where people have to pay for scientific research through who, or they already pay for scientific research with their taxes and yet privately owned um, academic journals somehow get the right to paywall that research, you know, with permission of the governments that originally paid for that research, which is, you know, theoretically funded by by you and me, by taxpayers, of course. Um, I'm just curious, what what do you think like upholds this like very crazy and seemingly backwards system? Ну, вообще, если говорить об аргументе, что если исследования финансируются на доплетельщиками, so, well, speaking about that arguments that you uh, that you provided that uh, you know since uh, since things are tax funded, then they should be available to uh, the public. Well, I don't think it's not it's necessarily true because, for example, there are a lot of secret studies being carried out which are also funded by taxpayers, but uh, you know very few people actually have access to them. Uh, but Speaking about what maintains uh, this uh, situation is, of course, the presence of intellectual property. So science has technically become the intellectual property of a number of corporations. So then are, are you against intellectual property? No, of course, I actually think that of course, I generally think that the internet should be completely communist. <laughs> that leads perfectly to my next question, um, which is I was curious to find to, to know more about your views on communism and its relationship to science. Um, so I've in the research that I've done, I had read a little bit that you had given some talks before about how um, communism and science are very, very similar. Um, so I'm curious if you could expand on, on this idea and, uh, yeah, because I, I also feel like Sci-Hub is a very communistic idea, of course. No, вообще был такой известный социолог по имени Роберт Нептон. So there was this guy called Robert Nepton, uh, a, uh, a researcher, and he had developed four, established the four principles of science. And one of those principles was communism which uh, which uh, implied that the results of uh, scientific studies could be access should be accessible to everyone and this is all, the only way that science can move forward 
ну, если говорить о каких-то моих тоже более личных мотивациях. So, uh, speaking about my personal motivation, uh, I think it's USSR related because in the USSR, our science, our scientific progress was really spectacular and science was a priority. But as soon as the Soviet Union fell apart, this also also uh, got really decayed. Mm. Potentially, then, maybe you were inspired for SciHub a little bit with this experience of living under communism and experiencing the, I guess, the effects of um, what happened when the Soviet Union fell, maybe. No, no, how SciHub, Well, I mean, SciHub was always a communistic project for me because based on the concept that scientific knowledge should be the property of everybody and accessible to everybody and not, you know, be confined to uh, a, a couple of uh, corporations. Because uh, if we're talking about how science works in general, a lot of researchers point out that only when science and scientific knowledge is common to everyone, only then can scientific progress be gained. I think this this like perfectly highlights, I think, the uh, like the way that capitalism, like through property and through enclosures of different types of property, um, it sort of inhibits human progress, actually. Um, you know, you can, uh, people, of course, have this idea, at least in the West, that, you know, um, capitalism has like, you know, propelled us into like technological advancements that have never been seen before. And only because of the free market have we been able to reach it. And because we've given, you know, billionaires a ton of money, then, you know, that's the, the only thing to incentivize people to actually make new stuff. Um, but here, I guess, if you're actually in the sciences and you're actually a part of maybe that bleeding edge, um, I think it's pretty easy to see that actually so this sort of tendency for private enclosure and private property under capitalism sort of inhibits scientific progress. Yeah, and there are plenty of scientific publications which uh, speak of the same, that uh, uh, commercialization and privatization of uh, scientific knowledge uh, hampers and hinders progress. And it's kind of interesting that Marx and Engels, they distinguished their form of socialism as scientific socialism as opposed to, you know, utopian socialism uh, previously. Um, so I, 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 when I was, you know, in, in my view, when I was reading, you know, their work, it was sort of like, I sort of resonated with trying to take a sign or how Marx and Engels were trying to take a scientific approach to history in the same way that, you know, I took a scientific approach to, you know, the things that I was studying in university or, or you know, different types of work that I was doing that was related to science. And I, I don't know if that, if that resonates with you at all. Ah, well, I heard a little bit there, but I didn't. I didn't really uh, catch uh, the end of it. Could you just please come again? Ah, uh, that's... Um, like I really resonated with the way that um, Marx and Engels were approaching uh, history from a scientific framework, Th similarly to how I approached, you know, um, whenever I was studying university, I studied neuroscience. So I had a very scientific approach um, to neuroscience, of course, and was taught and, you know, the scientific method and such in order to find out, you know, experiments, how they um, you know, having a, how important it is to have an independent and dependent variable and, like, you know, to be able to have these type of comparisons. And so I sort of resonated with the way that Marx and Engels tried to take a scientific approach to history. Ah, ну, кстати, если говорить о нейронауке, то тут я еще такой uh, аргумент. Speaking of neuroscience, actually, that's, that's one argument which I often, which I sometimes use. And uh, it's that if we think of how our brain works, it's technically a giant communication network where billions of neurons communicate with each other and so our brain is naturally communistic so uh, speaking uh, from that standpoint science should also be communist <laughs> I, I love that <laughs> <laughs> sure we could talk we could talk i i would love to make all these different uh, neuroscience metaphors with you now <laughs> and with communism <laughs> 
Um, but uh, so at the moment, um, you know, because of all these legal issues that uh, SciHub has faced, um, one of the ways that SciHub continues its operations is through accepting donations in cryptocurrency. I saw before it was just Bitcoin, but now you guys have expanded to a whole lot more. So people, if they go to the SciHub site, um, then they can give uh, in a lot of different cryptocurrencies they might hold to, to support um, SciHub. But um, I'm curious, why do you think this is the best way for a project like yours to receive some form of money to pay for your infrastructure? Ну, здесь все очень просто. Если ты пытаешься подключить какую-нибудь систему, которая принимает, например, пожертвования... Uh, well, that's actually very simple. So if you try to link uh, your project with some system that accepts donations, uh, like, and it accepts donations via bank cards, then even if you just simply go into the rules of that donation uh, website, then you're going to see that one of their rules is that the project has to be legal, so which 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 won't work in this case. And uh, so I did have PayPal at some point. It was actually, while it was working, it was very efficient and fast and people uh, kept sending donations, but it, at some prop point it would get frozen. Uh, by PayPal. So, and in 2013, uh, Elsevier uh, actually filed an official complaint uh, 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 about uh, SoyHub uh, with PayPal and my account was frozen for good. I think this highlights perfectly what exactly uh, I try to advocate for when it comes to projects and organizations that are similar to SciHub, where if you are actually going to counter sort of capitalist institutions in some way, then you're going to receive probably some pushback from those same institutions. And one of the easiest ways or the easiest things that they can do to stop you is to prevent you from getting a normal bank account, to stop you from getting PayPal or any, even if it's one of these other fintech companies, as long as it's linked to the traditional financial system, then they can stop you um, like crazy. I mean, you know, they, Elsevier or some other company like that just has to make a request to PayPal and they'll listen because there is, you know, solidarity amongst capitalists to sort of um, prevent this type of thing from from happening. Um, so, I'm, yeah, I guess, is does that resonate with, with you as well? No, да. Но я, кстати, еще подумала насчет СМИ, so, I, you know, I also thought about the thing that you said about the media and how maybe sci-hub and scientific paper topic may not sound too sexy to the media. Uh, every, every, each media has some editor-in-chief who is on top of, of, of uh, their work. And uh, in several cases, I spoke with journalists who did want to cover SciHub and did want to write about us. And the topic got blocked by the editor-in-chief. And uh, so um, uh, I, I even uh, recently, I'm not sure how true that is, but I recently spoke to one guy who works for uh, Russia Today, and he said, he wanted to write about Sohab, and he said that this publication was blocked at the very top level. Wow. <laughs> so, like, even, yeah, even, but I guess media companies know sort of who their bosses are, kind of. Like, mo a lot of media companies, at least nowadays, are sort of, um, they're funded by, um, I mean, they themselves are capitalist corporations, and they are very well funded by other capitalist corporations, or make a, a lot of money from them. But also their work, they, they themselves somehow are linked with this intellectual property. Yeah, that's, that's, a, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Like, I mean, more and more intellectual property has become sort of like a, um, a very, very like key thing for corporations to own in order to keep money flowing. I mean, in, in the case of, you know, I, I'm just thinking of like, you know, pharmaceutical companies um, keeping the intellectual property around their um, their product. If they can keep it for, um, you know, when they keep it, they, you know, generics can't be made, for example. 
um, and only until it expires, you know, after 10 years or something like that. But then there are all these loopholes where uh, pharmaceutical companies will, you know, uh, reapply for the intellectual property for the patent, like towards the end of their 10 years for a slightly different disease. Um, and then extended another 10 years that they can always keep that, that, that position. And so intellectual property is super important for a lot of different industries. And so I think when they, maybe when they see something like Sci-Hub, you know, maybe consciously or not, something is lighting up. They're like, oh shit, you know, that can mess with my business plan too. <laughs> but so... Have you ever received any criticisms for accepting cryptocurrencies as donations? Well, it's not really criticisms, but many say, I don't really know how to use cryptocurrencies. It's going to be difficult for me to learn. Can I, can I maybe use some PayPal? Can I just send you via bank account? Yeah, I guess one of the downsides of it, of course, is that, you know, there's a, you need to have specific knowledge on how to send it and how to use it. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess when you're in such a position, you don't really have a choice. <laughs> you can't say, oh yeah, I have a special PayPal just for you uh, or something like that. <laughs> um, and I guess part, part of this, I guess, is um, the reason why you've recently expanded to not just Bitcoin, but to other cryptocurrencies. Yeah, but even that proved not enough and people uh, keep sending me requests to add cryptocurrencies that I don't have yet, but I will add them later. <laughs> yeah, yeah but there's, there's, there are so many different ones that it's, it's uh, difficult to even keep up. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it, but it, it is, it is, it has been for me very, very interesting to see to, to see this like development happen over time where, um, I mean, I, I remember there was just the option for Bitcoin, um, but now you have uh, options for um, a lot of other ones, including like Ethereum. So by the way, uh, speaking of Bitcoin, I did get uh, some criticism at some point uh, because I was using the same address over and over again and people were claiming that it just wasn't anonymous enough and people and it could be easily seen how much money has been donated to me. So I've now set it up in such a way that the address is dynamically changing. Mm. Yeah, that, that's a that's a very uh, interesting point. Uh, what, one of the things that I guess is potentially a downside with accepting cryptocurrencies on a type of blockchain like Bitcoin and most of the other ones, if it's not a privacy oriented one, like something like Monero is more, um, it's more hidden, is that you can sort of see all of the transactions and potentially at some point in the future, um, you know, the, the FBI or whoever else that wants to do something could, you know, track and trace where the flow of money is going and could sort of um, attack your network through that information. So, by the way, there was one bit of criticism uh, saying that the donations to SoyHub are not very transparent. So, like, people don't, can't see how much I get and what I spend it on uh, and honestly the reason is, is that you know keeping all those accounts open and transparent is just very very time and resource consuming it, yeah and, and it's something that is potentially incriminating whether either to you or to someone that you are like interacting with or, or transacting with in order to keep up the infrastructure for sci-hub have you thought about, I'm curious about like using any of the smart contract applications for Ethereum or anything more advanced with that? So not yet, because honestly, I haven't explored it in enough detail yet. I know there's a course in Coursera uh, in uh, Bitcoin engineering. I've been thinking of doing this course sometime soon or uh, i had one more idea of maybe establishing some sort of scientific cryptocurrency because you know there are cryptocurrencies that are used in specific field but there's no such thing as scientific cryptocurrency we could uh, create some sort of a psycoin. coin <laughs> 
Yeah, that was, <laughs> I would uh, definitely invest in a Sci-Hub coin if that was uh, <laughs> available. <laughs> И, возможно, потенциально потом это использовать эту вот криптовалюту э, для того, чтобы... So, potentially we can use it to pay for the work of publishing houses. So, like, for example, today, in order to publish uh, in open access journals, you need to pay. Uh, the author has to pay uh, money, so it could be paid via scientific cryptocurrency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be very cool. I know I've, I've heard of a couple of different projects who are thinking somewhat similarly um, could be really interesting to, to, hook, to, to connect with them. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, some, some of the things um, that I was thinking, I know you haven't maybe done much time um, doing research on it, but like uh, I, I, it could be really interesting to have um, like using Ethereum smart contracts uh, to take, you know, the money that you receive and either Um, hold it in a type of multi-signature wallets or like a wallet that's hold by mul held by multiple people or you could sort of, you know, invest the money that you received into um, some sort of like um, decentralized financed application where you can earn interest on like the money that you're receiving. Um, some sort of interesting things like that. You could even make, you know, like a coin or a voting, a voting, uh, a governance token So a voting token where you can let people who are part of Sci-Hub be able to vote on particular things, but would be something very interesting at some point in the future. Um, so do you think others who are inspired by these type of communistic ideals um, should take cryptocurrency more seriously? No, actually, yes. Ah, no, yes. Cryptovaluta is such a thing. So, actually, I've noticed the crypto has a feature that it's more, um, uh, it's it, people with capitalist views tend to like it more. Yeah, because or maybe it's because uh, this is a sort of a uh, payment system that allows you to uh, make transactions not under government control. So... I think that crypto is sort of a capitalist thing and communists tend not to be, you know, very fond of it. Uh, maybe because, uh, you know, it's something to do with money and yeah, so they're not very much into it. That's something that I've observed as well, of course, is that generally people who are into cryptocurrency tend to lean to the right a bit more, let's say on, on, on average. I wouldn't say that's everyone, but I would say... Uh, On average, it, it, it's definitely leaning to the right. And it's sort of a big reason why I felt like I had to make um, the platform uh, to sort of give a, a left-wing voice uh, to that space and to give like a left-wing analysis of it. Um, but yeah, I guess, do you have... What, do you, what would be your argument to sort of get more people with similar ideas as you who maybe want to... Um, challenge these type of capitalist institutions, but um, who are maybe anti-crypto, what, what would you say to them? Uh, well, first, of course, I would say that cryptocurrency has this feature that it's decentralized. So this is genuinely people's money, which people themselves manage, uh, not like we How, not like it happens with banks where there's this big corporation where someone on top controls uh, the money. It's, uh, yeah, I guess reminding people that the current system is broken anyways <laughs> and that uh, it isn't an option for a lot of people, especially if you're going to challenge um, their, their, their power. So yeah, thanks a lot for um, for coming on. It's been super interesting. Uh, what I would like, I mean, one of the things that I think um, would be nice for people to know is uh, from you, what is the best way that they can support Sci-Hub right now at this moment? Well, I think the best way to uh, support Sci-Hub right now would be 
to promote it in a way that you know to help it to help it uh, get relieved of all the legal issues and uh, to promote it into being considered legal and uh, ultimately to help it with uh, taking down those restrictions of intellectual property and um, maybe to, to to end it off how can people keep up with what's going on with Sci-Hub and um, these types of issues? Так, ну, раньше я размещала все новости Sci-Hub в Твиттере, но как ты знаешь... So, you know, I used to previously post uh, all updates on Twitter, uh, but as you know, the account was recently blocked, was recently banned, it was in the beginning of this year. So I'm thinking of setting up a new section on the website itself sometime in the future so, so the people would be able to subscribe to updates and get them uh, to their mailboxes nice so a, a newsletter should be coming out maybe uh, as soon and maybe one last thing is can can you share the what is the url where people can go to to donate cryptocurrency well, yeah, then in the chat, I'll write, I'll write. Uh, let me just type it in the chat all right so sci-hub.ru slash crypto donate Okay, or sci-hub.se slash crypto donate. Uh, so SE is, uh, .se is banned in many places. The one which is with the dot .ru uh, address, it's quite new and it's possibly uh, available in many, many places now. The dot .ru one is newer. All right, great. I'll be sure to include those in the in the episode description. So people should definitely check out the website. They should uh, donate some amount of crypto because it is for a very good cause and it's for something that is uh, actually challenging capitalist institutions. And um, yeah, Alexandra is doing you know, God's work in um, uh, fighting against these type of uh, yeah, gatekeepers of scientific information. So thank you so much for coming on and um, I, I wish, you know, Sci-Hub all the best. I'm just going to say a couple of words to Alexandra. I just wanted to say that I uh, I mentioned Sci-Hub in my, in my acknowledgements uh, section in, in the uh, dissertation, in my PhD dissertation. It's in the link between late life depression and dementia, because I'm a psychiatrist. So I encourage everybody to do the same, personally. Спасибо большое. Thank you so much. Thank you.